So, this insane dude has a long nose and tells fantastic unbelievable stories about the adventures he once had, right? And the crazy stuff he comes up with plays a big role in One Piece and turns into reality later on. Are you talking about Usopp? No, I am talking about the Baron von Münchhausen and he and his stories could be the key to many still existing mysteries in One Piece. Just look at this scene. Or this one. And no, that's not a shot from the live action. If you want to know more, keep watching. The way I view the world is by making connections. So let me connect you to... Wrong channel, dude. But... No buts. Before we begin, it would mean a lot to me if you could hit the subscribe button and give the video a thumbs up. Unfortunately, most of my viewers are not subscribed, causing them to miss out on many of the upcoming videos. So please, help me grow my channel by subscribing and liking the video. Thank you so much. Look at these guys and tell me you are not seeing similarities. I will tell you about it in a second, but let me give you a quick rundown about Münchhausen first. The Baron of Münchhausen is a fictional German nobleman created in 1785. Although loosely based on the once real Baron Hieronymus Karl Friedrich Freier von Münchhausen, that's a long title I know, his adventures were still far from being real. The influence of his stories in One Piece is undeniable, and once you start noticing the similarities, you won't be able to unsee them. Many of the old tales were written down in books, but with the rise of modern media, stories about Münchhausen found their way into both animated and live action films. In my opinion, Oda learned about the adventures of Münchhausen through these and then looked further into the topic by reading the original sources. I will address both literature and movie influences on One Piece. In 1988, Terry Gilliam, a former member of Monty Python, created the movie The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Monty Python, they were blah blah, no one wants to hear stories about that old stuff. But Monty Python is really funny and no. Anyway, this movie also aired in Japan and was later sold on media like VHS or the media of the future, Laserdisc. Um, just kidding, Laserdisc had no success at all. The movie itself was mostly inspired by the original stories about Münchhausen, but in classic Hollywood fashion, a few things were added here and there. If you are planning to watch the movie, I suggest doing so before continuing this video, as I'll be sharing a considerable amount of material from it. The film begins with a group performing a play about Münchhausen's story in front of an audience. Suddenly, the very old real Baron walks into the theater, demanding to halt the performance. Initially, no one believes he is a genuine Baron since everyone thinks he is a fictional character. The only one who really believes in him is a little girl. Then things happen and from one moment to another, the Baron and the girl find themselves within a new adventure. The first thing that piqued my interest is the hot air balloon they use for their escape. Believe it or not, it's made out of panties. But it's not just about the material. Take a look at the vehicle itself. Doesn't it resemble Morgan's ship? No, it's not a teapot. In my opinion, they still look pretty similar. But it's not only that, because big news Morgan's ship is being pulled by birds. If one of Münchhausen's stories, he catches several ducks by tying bacon to leashes. The problem was, after eating the bacon, the ducks started to fly. So he sailed through the sky, pulled by the ducks, using his coat as a sail. It doesn't take long before we see the ship sailing through the clouds, giving me a crazy Skypia wipe. Shortly after that, the Baron and the girl arrive on the moon. Yes, the moon. The moon? The moon, yes. And one of the first things we see is a planetary system that strikingly resembles the one in the Tree of Knowledge on Ohara. Then, what's with buildings painted on them move around, rearranging the scenery. They kinda remind me of Water 7, or actually, the ruins that Enil finds on the moon. The moon? Yes, the moon. It is here where we encounter Robin Williams as the king of the moon. The moon? Shut up! <clears throat> so, yes. Actually, he insists on being referred to by his complete title, which is the king of everything. Ray D. Tutu. Nope, I'm not joking. That's how the character is called. Ray D. Tutu. Written correctly though, Re di Tutto in Italian means king of everything. Interesting, huh? Is that maybe why Oda came up with the idea to give characters the moniker D? The king tells Münchhausen that he governs the known universe, and what he doesn't know, he creates. If you've seen my previous video, The Mega Theory, you'll appreciate this even more. 
Essentially, he says he brings things into existence by imagining them. But yes, I know what all of you are thinking. When will he address the fact that that dude looks like a celestial dragon? It's crazy, right? He and his queen, that's her by the way, might have been the inspiration for the celestial dragons. I don't think I need to tell you, but for completion's sake, celestial is an adjective pertaining to the sky, visible heaven or the universe beyond Earth's atmosphere. Makes sense that they are called that if they are modeled after the king of the moon, right? Now that we are talking about how characters look, doesn't the Baron kinda look like Hero look in this movie? You know, before Munchausen and the girl start their adventure, he's on the verge of dying. But the little girl holds on to him, telling him not to die. He answers that he's tired of living, because the world is only logic and reason now, science and progress. There is no place for three-legged cyclops, cucumber trees, oceans of wine, no place for him. He's basically saying that in this ever-changing world, fairy tales, myths and fantasy have no place anymore, and so does he. But the girl asks him to finish the story about the sultan that he was telling before. But he gets angry and says, who cares about that? But she insists and tells him she cares and wants to know. The Baron suddenly seems more motivated again and becomes younger over the course of the adventure. Do you understand what I am getting at? When do you think a person dies? When his heart is pierced by a bullet? No. When he is inflicted with incurable disease? No. When he drinks soup made from a poisonous mushroom? No. A man dies when he is forgotten. The girl in a way prevented the Baron from dying because she really cared about him and his stories. Oh, while I am talking about this, have you ever noticed that Hiroluk was not talking solely about himself? Because Clover took the bullet and Roger was inflicted with an incurable disease. He was mentioning two other examples among himself. It seems like could old Hiroluk knew Roger and Clover? But that might be a topic for another video. But since I'm speaking about Roger, there is another very old cartoon about Munchausen made in Germany in the midst of World War II. And if you ask me, the Baron in this one almost looks a bit like Roger. But maybe that's just a beard. So back to the King and Queen of the Moon, or more like the Celestial Dragons. The weird part about them is that they are able to split their heads from their bodies. But that's nothing new in One Piece, right? Buggy does it all the time. But also Law is able to do it. I'm pretty sure that's where Oda got the idea for that. The Baron and the girl then gets thrown into a cage and this is where he finds Berthold, one of his missing companions. For some reason he forgot who he was or who the Baron is but remembers it after a while. That kinda reminds me of what Sugar did to the people on Dressrosa. Berthold is able to run extremely fast and by fast I mean so fast that he was able to get a bottle of wine from Vienna and bring it back to Munchausen who was in Turkey within one hour. To put this into perspective, that's 2300 kilometers or 1420 miles. I wonder if someone in Blackbeard's crew is able to do exactly that in the future. Uh, why do you say that? Because I think most of the Blackbeard crewmates are inspired by Munchausen's crew. One of his companions just looks like Van Auger and is basically able to shoot down things in a long distance. We've seen Van Auger doing that in chapter 222. The poor seagulls drop dead onto the Mary's deck. In the Hollywood movie, this companion of Munchausen is named Adolphus. Just look at him. Tell me Oda didn't copy his design one to one. In the books, this man also was able to shoot down birds miles away. Another one of his companions is named Albrecht in the movie. This man is extremely strong. He can rip out trees from the ground and in the film he grabs the anchors of three ships and flings them upon the enemies. If that's not Jesus Burgess, then I don't know what else to tell you. We also have a candidate for Doc Q. In the movie, his name is Gustavus. His ability in the stories was that he could hear extremely well. To do that, he would press the ear against the ground and then tell the Baron exactly how many people are moving, how far away. And by far away, I mean far away. When Berthold went from Turkey to Vienna to get the wine, he fell asleep halfway back under a tree. Gustavus was able to hear him snoring from 600 miles away, so he would tell Adolphus to shoot near him so that he wakes up and brings the wine. Uh, that sounds crazy! Yeah, the stories are quite fun. But all these similarities make me feel like one of Blackbeard's crewmates will be able to move extremely fast. Either it's Lafitte or Shiryu or Devon, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure one of them will have the ability like that. 
The last companion of Münchhausen had an ability that enabled him to produce strong winds just by exhaling. In the movie they gave that ability to Gustavus, but in the actual stories this power belonged to another companion. I feel like the one who will be able to do this is either Sancho and Wolf or Vaskoshot. The dude literally can bring the storm. But I don't want to forget to mention the white horse that Münchhausen is riding on. Obviously that's stronger. So as you can see, pretty much all of Blackbeard's crew can be connected to the Münchhausen's characters. But back to the moon. The queen actually helps them to escape from the cage and the moment the king notices that, he chases them on his three-headed vulture, throwing huge asparagus after them. The queen actually wants to go down to earth together with the baron, that kinda sounds like the tale of Kaguya to me by the way, but it can't be. She entrusts him with a part of her braid and with it they attempt to climb down from the moon. At some point Berthold notices that the rope made of hair isn't long enough, this is when the baron hands him another piece of braid. Berthold is like, oh where did you get that from? And the baron answers, I took it from the top. He tells him to attach it onto the end so they can climb on, but the moment Berthold notices that the baron detached the braid from the moon, reality kicks in and they start falling. Sounds like stuff that would happen in cartoons, right? But it happens in One Piece too. Generally, I think Toon Force is something that we will see happening more in the future. They fall through space onto the planet into a volcano. The impact of their bodies even creates a little crater. Just like when Luffy was sent flying and arrived at Emerson Lily with the power of Kuma's fruit. But for some reason, they are alright. Or as the girl says... Still in one piece. Then they encounter the giants. They are called Cyclops and led by the god Vulcan. A god of war and destruction. But the moment that Vulcan lifts them out of the crater with his huge hand, they become just as big as him. Uh, that's kinda weird. Oh, I think it was funny. Anyway, the giants are building weapons of all kinds, even thermonuclear bombs. This is a wild mix of fantasy, reality and science fiction, but isn't exactly that how One Piece works too? We got giants, we got spaceships and we got weapons of mass destruction. The giants living on the fiery planet could very well resemble the Lunarians who once resided on the red line. Vulcan, in my opinion, looks pretty much like Saul though. I mean, just look at the two guys. Then Vulcan introduces the Baron and his companions to his wife, who appears out of a clam, just like the famous painting of Venus, or the woman that we see portrayed on Kuma's Bible. But also, she has a daddy complex and feels very attracted to the old Munchausen, which leads to Vulcan getting angry and throwing the Baron and his followers into a whirlpool of water. If you have seen my mega theory, then you know what comes next. Because the swirl of water is a gate to another dimension. Once they were in it, they started falling down through some kind of wormhole or portal and then end up at the surface of an ocean. But the world was turned upside down. This is exactly what we see with S Shark in the latest opening. But if you haven't seen my mega theory, let me break it down for you, very oversimplified. Because I think that the Tarai current, the big swirl in between Annie's lobby, Impel Down and Marine Fort, is the entrance to Love Tail. And if you go through that huge whirlpool, you will end up at the final island. Well, that was a very short version. Uh, true, but I feel like it's enough to understand the point I am making. So, once they adapted to the world being turned upside down, they noticed a particular island. It's not too far away from them, but for some reason, it starts moving. Actually, the whole thing is a ginormous fish and it ends up swallowing them whole. We see Laboon do something similar to the straw hats. While inside the fish, the Baron and his folks found another missing member of their party, which reminded me of the straw hats finding Crocus inside Laboon. I feel like the whole big sea creature eats people thematic left quite the impression on Oda. Same goes for the whirlpools. I'm certain that the entrance to Love Tale will work in a similar way. Swords in general are an important element in One Piece, but I will make a separate video on that topic as an addition to my mega theory. But do you remember what I said about the girl earlier? That she believed in Münchhausen and his stories? When I saw that, I had to think of Bonnie who was searching for Nika because she always believed in him. And as we all know, she finally was successful. But for the little girl, Münchhausen is her Nika. The reason they fled from the town earlier in the story, with the help of Morgan's flying ship, 
was to find all these lost comrades of Münchhausen so they could fight the Turkish army that was besieging the city. You see, the warrior of liberation that fights freely with the power of his fantasy, Nika and Münchhausen mirror each other pretty well. Both experienced crazy adventures and both fought against all kinds of monsters and armies. It's not only that, there are even more parallels. There is a story about Münchhausen in which he rides on a cannonball, just like Kizaru did at Sabaody. In another story, his horse gets cut in half but it still lives on without a problem until he notices that one half is missing and it's later reattached. In another story, he accidentally throws his axe up to the moon to retrieve it. He climbs up a huge beanstalk all the way up there. In my mega theory, I connect exactly this to Joy Boy because we also have a giant beanstalk in one piece and we also have a giant axe in a high place. Just look at the picture of this cover story. Weird, isn't it? Why is there such a gigantic axe in Skypiea? Well, I can actually tell you why. Just look at this map that Luffy found. Yeah, there is a giant with an axe on it. Yep, after this one, you should really check out my other video about Joy Boy. But back to the movie. I told you that they got swallowed by the big fish, right? In it, they find one of their comrades and the entire inside of the fish is engulfed by a dark blue light and there are tons of shipwrecks. Could that be a hint for the all blue? Anyway, take a look at the eye of the fish. Beside it looking quite fishy, it also reminds me a bit of Emu. There are already many theories about Emu possibly being connected to the sea, so maybe it's another hint. So far, we started at a town, went to the moon, then inside of a volcano with giants inside, a giant fish which could be replaced by a whale, ships falling from the sky, the goddess looking like the woman in Kuma's book, and so on. But there's even more. Shake, 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 Sinora, shake your body liner. First of all, throughout the movie, Münchhausen is on the verge of death several times, and death itself always is close to him to finally take his soul. Whenever that happens, the Baron keeps yelling, No doctors! That kinda reminded me of Drum Island, as there are no doctors there, and it makes sense because Münchhausen himself looks a lot like Hero Look. But it's not only that, because overall, the Baron looks quite piratey like, with his head and his whole outfit that reminds me of Gold Roger. Also, he has a long nose, not only in the movie, but in the books too. And he tells stories which turn out to be true later on, just like Usopp. I am pretty sure that Münchhausen is the inspiration for Usopp, and not only Pinocchio. Because yes, Pinocchio has a long nose and he lies, but Münchhausen is the one who tells fantastic stories that become true. Just like the tales that Usopp used to tell Kaya, remember? He foretold that pirates would attack the village, and that happened. He told stories about the gigantic goldfish, which became true later on. He spoke about the country of dwarves, and then we had Tontada, and so on, and so on. But the most important of Usopp's stories maybe will one day fulfill Chopper's dream. Which is, that there is a legendary medicine that cures any kind of disease on the other side of the sea. If Usopp is truly anything like Münchhausen, and I believe he is, then this will also prove to be true. It will become very important for Luffy later on because, as we've seen, he has brought his body to his limits too many times within the story. I think just as Münchhausen influences the universe with his stories and imagination, so do Usopp and Luffy. They are both inspired greatly by the Baron and both of them bring joy to the people they encounter. But there is more. The mayor of the town that was besieged by the Turks, can you guess what his name is? Uh, whoop, a slap, uh. No, no, the name of the mayor is Horatio Jackson. Uh, we oui. and? Well, doesn't that sound a lot like Oro Jackson? Oh. And no, this is not a shot from the One Piece live action. It's from the movie. Doesn't this look a lot like Loketown and the platform on which Roger's execution took place? It's fascinating how many scenes in this movie might have inspired Oda. But then it happens, the mayor, who now looks like another Venorga clone, shoots the Baron and this is when a doctor appears. Wait, uh, I have seen a silhouette like this before. You mean Doc Hugh? No, I mean when Absalom opens the door to the zombie generals. His shadow just looks like that dude. And the door also just looks like Emu, right? Oui! Well, yes, but it's even more important what happens afterwards, because that's the reason why the Baron always said, no doctors, no doctors. Because, it turns out, this doctor is Death himself, and here to take his soul. And this, my friend, looks exactly like the scene when Zorro faced the Grim Reaper. He came to take his soul, and this is exactly what is happening in this scene. This Angel of Death is taking the soul from the Baron's mouth, therefore ending his life. 
As you can see, the soul is green, just like how Brooke's soul is portrayed. A skeleton and a green soul, huh? Anyway, after this is when the story ends, or so we thought, but in reality it was just another story of Münchhausen and he's fine and alive, standing on a stage which he stormed at the beginning of the movie when he started telling his stories. The whole thing is really meta, but that is what makes the movie so interesting. This is exactly the reason why I think One Piece will end in a similar fashion. If you want to know what I mean, then I really can just tell you to watch my Mega Theory once again. You won't be disappointed. However, there's one last story that wasn't shown in the movie. It's about Baron Münchhausen attempting to use a post horn in wintertime. When he tried blowing into it, no sound came out of it because the horn was frozen solid from the cold. But later, after he entered the warm house and sat by a fireplace, the horn started thawing. And all the sounds he had tried to produce earlier suddenly emerged. But why is that interesting? We! Why? Well, we know there is something in One Piece that is also in some kind of big freezer, right? Us? Well, yes, but no, I mean the giant straw hat. I already have multiple theories on the element of ice about One Piece, but this just further adds to it. What if the straw hat has properties that can't be unfolded as long as it's kept within a frosty climate? What if that giant straw hat actually will reveal an amazing power as soon as it starts defrosting? We do know some sound that seems to be important and was the source of power that was used by the ancient kingdom. The power of the Don. Don do toto. And maybe this power of the Don will bring down the red lion once it's unleashed. There are even more stories about the Baron and I am sure you can find even more stuff in the movie. But after that 1 hour and 20 minute video I made last time, I want to keep coming theories a bit shorter. So I really hope you enjoyed what I have told you so far. If you did, leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell to not miss any stuff I drop in the future. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you next time. Peace. Thank <laughs> you.